You know, we're living in a society. But they want to deliver vast amounts of information over the internet. It's, it's a series of tubes. We're supposed to act in a civilized way. Allison, can you explain what internet is? Welcome. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome back to Indirect Message. I'm Lacey Green. I apologize if I sound a little weird today. I am still recovering from a mild case of breakthrough COVID, which, side note, wasn't too bad, but I wouldn't recommend it. I've got a bit of a brain melter for you today, and it all starts with a seemingly simple question. What is an emotion? Our emotions have been the topic of study and discussion by philosophers for hundreds of years, and more recently by scientists. But despite the fact that our emotions basically mediate our entire perception of the world, we know surprisingly little about them. So today, we're going to discuss a new understanding of emotion that is emerging in neuropsychology. It tells us more about what emotions actually are and how they're created. And these discoveries are a pretty big deal. It has enormous implications for some big questions, like, you know, how well can we control our emotions, really? To what extent should we be held accountable for emotional outbursts? Are policies like trigger warnings and safe spaces helping us to deal with trauma effectively? And how can we actually become more emotionally intelligent people to feel more positive emotions and have stronger relationships? All that and more, straight ahead. Chapter 1. Emotions are predictions. When we think about what an emotion is, I think for most of us it feels like emotions are reactions to things happening around us. And sometimes these are sort of visceral gut reactions that feel out of our control. For instance, I see a rattlesnake. I react with intense fear. And then I run. The idea is that we're born with ancient emotion circuits buried deep somewhere inside the more animalistic parts of our brain, you know, so we have an inner beast. And that when something triggers one of these circuits, it generates uh, almost like a reflexive response. This is Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. In the world of neuropsychology, Lisa is basically a rock star. She's a neuroscientist who's been doing groundbreaking research about emotion for 30 years now. She points out that even after almost a century of research, scientists still have not found a consistent physical fingerprint for even one single emotion. From her TED Talk, It may feel to you like your emotions are hardwired and they just trigger and happen to you, but they don't. You might believe that your brain is pre-wired with emotion circuits, you know, that you're born with emotion circuits, but you're not. In fact, none of us in this room have emotion circuits in our brain. In fact, no brain on this planet contains emotion circuits. What Lisa is sort of debunking here is the classical view of emotions. But research the past few decades is painting a different picture that emotions aren't reactions. They are predictions happening in the brain. Predictions that anticipate what's going to happen next. So what your brain is doing is basically in this moment, it's making a guess. Well, the last time that I was in this situation and my body was in this state, I did this thing. And as a consequence, I saw this, I felt this, I heard this. And so what your brain is doing is literally projecting itself into the future and predicting what's gonna happen in a moment from now, what motor actions your body should take and what you're likely to hear and see and feel and smell and so on. And when I say that your brain is making a prediction, I don't mean it in like an abstract way. Your brain is actually changing the firing of its own neurons. So it's actually starting to prepare your experience before the sense data even arrive. All right, I'm going to be real with you guys here. Feldman's work took me a few weeks of mulling over to really wrap my head around. I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive and abstract, right? But the basic gist is this. Every experience we have becomes wired into the brain. Every experience is information that is stored for the future. Emotions, then, are guesses that are based on those past experiences. 
When I see that snake and I feel that rush of fear, that fear is not my brain reacting, it's my brain predicting based on everything that it knows about snakes. So this is really cool and, and mind-blowing and almost kind of beautiful to me because it means that emotions are what's happening when the brain is constructing the world. And that's all happening entirely outside of our awareness. So what does this mean for our ability to control our emotions? Normally, when we think about control in this very classical way, you know, okay, so something comes along and it triggers emotion. All we can do is kind of deal with that after the fact, you know, we can try to calm ourselves down or, you know, or maybe we can put ourselves in a different situation or maybe think about something else differently. And then, you know, maybe the trigger won't be there the next time, but that's not really how it works. And instead how it works, your brain, when it's, when it's uncertain about something, it can't predict very well. It tries to learn and that learning goes along with arousal. So the learning is made easier when certain chemicals are there. And so whenever your brain can't predict very well, your amygdala marshals lots of resources so that your brain can try to learn and therefore predict better the next time. Chapter two, mind control. The human drama that is being alive means having intense experiences of emotion. There's the drug-like high of being infatuated with someone, the painful grief of heartache or a death, the utter rage provoked by an injustice, or the euphoria of being on a winning team. Lisa's work finds that it is possible to turn down the dial on negative emotions and to inject more positive emotions into our lives. But it isn't exactly a matter of sheer willpower or channeling your inner zen. It's a matter of teaching our minds to start changing its predictions. The way that you gain more control is to understand that control isn't overcoming what you feel or what you want to do in a given situation. It's not wrestling your inner beast to the ground, you know? The control that you have that's easiest to enact is to train yourself to curate experiences for yourself when you're not in the heat of the moment. And if you practice making these experiences, your brain will start to make them automatically. Um, and so really what you're doing is you're training your brain to predict differently in the future. So a really important way to think about what's happening here is that you are always cultivating your past. Every experience you have now, every action you take, becomes your past and that past is available the brain can reconstitute it reassemble it for the purposes of predicting the future which become the present now obviously this isn't an overnight process no matter what positivity culture or self-help gurus claim it's simply impossible to get rid of negative emotions completely and why would you want to right it's part of being human but we can reframe them in more helpful and productive ways. Back to our TED Talk. So here's an example. Some people experience crippling anxiety before a test. They have test anxiety. Based on past experiences of taking tests, their brains predict a hammering heartbeat, sweaty hands, so much so that they are unable to actually uh, take the test. But here's the thing. A hammering heartbeat is not necessarily anxiety. And research shows that when students learn to make determination, right, energize, this kind of energized determination, instead of anxiety, they perform better on tests. And that determination seeds their brain to predict differently in the future so that they can get their butterflies flying in formation. So I call this emotional intelligence in action. So Lisa's research shows how we can slowly recategorize negative emotions like anxiety through new experiences. And we can also use this technique to infuse more positive emotion into our daily lives. I decided a number of years ago that I was going to practice the experience of awe. You know, one of my colleagues down the hall from me studies positive emotions and the power of positive emotions. And I'm just inherently skeptical person. And I'm like, yeah, okay, okay, okay 
positive. You know, so I just want to see this for myself. So I thought, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to spend five minutes a day and I'm going to practice cultivating awe. And I'm going to try to cultivate awe out of things that are not really awe-inspiring naturally to me. Like, for example, seeing a dandelion poke its ugly little yellow head out of a, uh, you know, crack in a sidewalk. And instead of seeing a weed, I'm going to experience this as the awesome power of nature to not be constrained by humans' attempts to control it. And sure enough, not only did I get really automatic at making, I can turn on awe whenever I need it. So, you know, when I'm sitting in a faculty meeting or I'm, I'm listening to, you know, some administrator drone on about something that would probably in the past have really irritated me, I can just take a step back and cultivate experience of awe right in the room. It happens automatically almost um, because I've practiced it so much. Chapter three, trigger warning. Lisa's work made me wonder about how our culture deals with uncomfortable feelings. There's been a big push, driven by empathy, I think, to minimize or shield people from experiencing distressing emotions. You know, there's a widely held belief that being triggered can cause tremendous emotional harm. And so came safe spaces and trigger warnings. Originally, these were tools used to help people with PTSD. But then the concept of being triggered became a meme. Triggered now refers to all kinds of uncomfortable emotions, ranging from its original meaning to, you know, feeling a little disturbed to being offended. It's sort of a catch-all now for feelings I don't want to have right now. Lisa argues that this use of trigger warnings in safe spaces might not be as helpful as we imagine. Sometimes feeling a bit of yuck, you know, feeling a bit of discomfort means that you are learning, that you are changing, and you cannot get there without that feeling. The research on trigger warnings is really mixed. I think it's hard for me intuitively because, for example, there are some things I don't like being surprised by, right? There's some things like watching a movie where a small child is harmed, that's just, I feel every time feel like I've been punched in the gut. And I really, really don't, I really don't like it. And I do have this experience of feeling like triggered by something, right? The thing is though, that if you avoid the things that make you uncomfortable, you have no opportunity to transform them into um, something to learn from. The whole discussion is, is complicated by what we do with these warnings and whether we're encouraging people to avoid things that make them uncomfortable or whether we're supporting them and empowering them to face something that's uncomfortable and transform it into something that's useful. Another interesting takeaway here, strong emotional responses, like those that might be experienced by people with PTSD, are rational responses. If your brain has been wired by an environment that is full of threat and that's depleting of energy, and therefore your brain, when you move to a safe environment, your brain hasn't updated its model, it hasn't learned, it can't learn because you're, you're exhausted, you know, you're basically running a body budgeting deficit. So it's running a model that is, you know, doesn't fit the world that you're in, but it fits some other world very well. That's not illogical. It doesn't mean that it's productive. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's optimal, but I wouldn't call it irrational. Essentially, our brains only know what it has experienced. Clearly, everyone, you know, should be accountable for their own behavior and their own emotions, but we can understand people's emotions better by understanding where they're coming from, by understanding the experiences that they are predicting from. In, in my experience, this is where a lot of assumptions come in. You know, a lot of the time we just sort of project our own experiences, our own feelings on other people. You should feel this way because I feel this way. But we're all predicting and having our emotions based on different life experiences. This also seems to imply that being accountable for our own emotions and behavior needs to include a deliberate effort to deconstruct 
emotions that are toxic to others or ourselves and to actively recategorize them so that we can actually set ourselves up for emotional success in the future. Chapter 4, Emotional Intelligence. Okay, there is one last bit of information that's important here, and that's really the sort of practical how-to part. We've touched on it a little bit, but I want to give you guys some more information. Every emotion that we have starts with four basic affects, you know, that every human on the planet shares. Those four basic affects are comfort and discomfort, agitation, and calm. And at any given moment, we are all somewhere on the spectrum of those four affects. And this is because those affects stem from our physiology, from our bodies. These simple feelings are not emotions. They're actually with you every waking moment of your life. They are simple summaries of what's going on inside your body, kind of like a barometer, but they have very little detail. And you need that detail to know what to do next. What do you do about these feelings? And so how does your brain give you that detail? Well, that's what predictions are. Predictions link the sensations in your body that give you these simple feelings with what's going on around you in the world so that you know what to do. And sometimes, sometimes those constructions are emotions. When a basic affect is very intense, that is your brain making an emotion out of them. An intense feeling of agitation we might call rage. An intense feeling of comfort we might call peace, right? So these affects are the basic ingredients that we can use to recategorize our emotions. To recategorize, first we need to deconstruct an emotion down to its simple physical sensations. You know, my anxiety deconstructed is my beating heart. Then I can recategorize these sensations with new emotional concepts. So the last piece here to succeed at this is that we need to have emotional concepts to work with. There are some basic emotions that we can all identify, like anger, joy, disgust, sadness. Yeah, I'm thinking of Pixar's Inside Out here. But ideally, we should be able to be more specific than I feel happy and I feel sad. So emotionally intelligent people can identify a large number of complex emotions within themselves accurately. Lisa describes emotional intelligence as having a lot of emotional concepts and then knowing which ones to use and when. In psychology, a bunch of things which are similar to each other is called a category. And a representation of a category is called a concept. So what your brain is doing is it's making a conceptual category. And if it's drawing on instances in the past that you learned were anger, or someone told you that they were anger, or you constructed them as anger, then what your brain is doing is making an anger category. And it's preemptively predicting that what is going to happen in a moment from now will be well described and explained by anger. Complex emotions usually combine, you know, one or more simple emotions. Shame is a complex emotion that people sometimes struggle to identify in themselves. It's, it's discomfort, it's agitation, but directed toward ourselves. Jealousy, curiosity, gratitude. I mean, there are thousands of emotional concepts. Maybe millions? Maybe. When we look at cultures across the world, many of them have created emotional concepts that we don't have words for in English. Like schadenfreude, you know, the German emotional concept that describes guilty pleasure in someone else's pain. The Danish huga, not sure if I'm saying that right, but it's an emotional concept that describes a type of coziness and contentment. Or the Japanese omayari, which describes a type of compassion and sensitivity to other people's feelings. So how can we gain more emotional concepts to use? Lisa notes that people who travel or learn multiple languages tend to have more of this emotional granularity. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a pretty good case for exposure to more cultures, to more types of people, more belief systems and perspectives. If the goal is to become more emotionally intelligent, then we need to have experiences that push us out of our daily routines and out of our comfort zones. These experiences can give complexity and nuance to our understanding of the world. And we can use that complexity to better understand ourselves 
in the process. I wanted to give a big thank you to Dr. Feldman Barrett for making time to help me on this episode. As a side note, a lot of what Lisa is describing here sounds to me a lot like the techniques used by Stoic philosophers, which I am a pretty big fan of. So if you want more specific exercises to reframe, you should check out my episode called The Stoic Challenge. I think we go over five or six different exercises in the episode, and I don't want to overstate it, but you know, those exercises have helped me a lot in my life. Much love, you guys. Happy 2022. I'll be back again soon with some very special guests.